Uh, please give it up for Mr. Paul Greenberg, please. First, thanks for having me. I actually uh, keynoted the very first Zoholics. What I'm going to do today is actually go through from the small business side up to the enterprise matters, which is your customer's experience. What is it? How do you affect it? How are you actually able to anticipate it? And how then do you build things and manage it so that it impacts the customers in the best possible way? So let's start looking at it. You see the title here, it says a company like me, and we're gonna to get to what that means, but I want you to keep that phrase in your head as we move through this. But to do that, to actually understand what a company like me even means, you have to begin to think about the digital customer that we have now. And we are, look, we're all digital customers ourselves, so I don't really have to explain that much to you. But there is some business implications that you do have to know in order to actually affect that kind of great customer experience that you want. The first thing is this, that if you think that 12, 15 years ago we underwent a business revolution, let me disabuse you of that now. We did not undergo a business revolution. We actually underwent a communications revolution, which impacted every single institution on this planet, most of the people on this planet, and it changed how we communicate, with what we communicate, what we expect of those communications, why we communicate, and it, how we even trust. And it also changed the way we consider, think about, and do information. It's how we, how we create it, how we distribute it, and how we consume it has been transformed irrevocably. So we've got a world now where every single customer of every single company pretty much thinks, I have expectations that have to be met that are considerably higher than they used to be, and if you don't meet them, guess what? We have the world of e-commerce out there, and I'm going to always go somewhere else to find something else, or find what I need. So you, as companies, either physical or digital, have to provide me with more than just good products and services. And we're going to go into the details of what that is in just a moment. But the first thing you have to look at when a customer is talking to you and thinking about is how much they actually trust us, really. I mean, look, you know... <laughs> There's a lot of data out there on peer trust versus brand trust about a brand. And if you look at the data, if you're listening to a brand about itself, the level of trust, depending on whose study you look at, is somewhere between 10% and 53. 53 was a high-end uh, Forrester study a while back. If you're looking at peer trust, meaning a person like me, meaning a person who you feel, and keep that word feel in your heads throughout this whole thing, a person you feel is like you. Someone who you think has similar habits, similar ideas, similar notions. It's not a blood relative particularly, but maybe a similar hobby, maybe a similar political outlook, maybe they all rule for the Yankees like I do, right? Maybe someone who you feel really reflects your kind of thinking and activity. Brand, when you're looking at brands, Via, when peers are talking to you about it, the trust level low end is 72% and the high end is 94%. So you're looking at essentially, yeah, when it boils down to it, the number one trust uh, source of, of trust is peers, is people like me. Yet, look at this Edelman Trust Barometer, which is the trusted source on who is your trusted source, right? Trust in companies is the number one concern in the public for years on end. Look, you're all companies. You're part of that. So you have to actually be able to capture the trust of your customers. And it's not a simple thing to do, no matter how big or small you are. These are some of the basics that you all know, I'm sure, in terms of what it takes to be trusted. You have to provide them with the quality goods and services and, and also what I'm calling consumable experiences. They, they have to somehow or another know that you're honest and a believable company, that you're uh, empathetic uh, and that your culture reflects that. And one of the things that makes Zoho unique and I always did was actually the fact that their culture is so good. It's why you're here. You actually have, you know, think of the title of the conference itself, right? Zoholics, right? Which basically says advocates, right? People who, who love us. Right, so that, that culture matters a great deal. And you could be a company of one. I'm a company of one, 
right? So you can be a company of one, and you still have to have the culture when it comes to at least your interactions with customers, the way you interact with people around you, that says, I am someone that you can count on, that I will deliver on my promise, that I am a good person or I'm a good company, etc. And that's where you start getting into the early realms of a company like me, right? So you'll start to see that. So these are the kind of things. And, and part of it, one of the bigger parts, is listening. Just listen to what they have to say and act on it. But here's the deal. Just to be clear, the customer isn't always right. Right? And you have to realize that, right? Sometimes you can't do what the customer demands of you. I want you to think of this. I'm going to go scale up for a minute. Citigroup has 300 million customers demanding things of them. Now, do you think Citigroup can do all the things that the 300 million customers are asking them to do? Of course not. But when you're not doing something or you can't do something, just be honest about it, right? Just be honest about it. Just tell them, look, I can't do this, here's why. Right? Always, always be clear with those customers. And you establish trust. All right, but here's the other aspect of this. So if you're willing to even begin to consider how to do that kind of thing and design the kind of customer experience that you need to do that and engender the kind of trust you must, there's another issue you got to deal with, which we're talking about a communications revolution. Well, the communications themselves actually matters a great deal now, more so than ever. You know, when you go back a few years, the strategy around communications with your customers was, was multi-channel. That was the idea. And multi-channel meant at that time, you found out all the ways your customers communicated and, and, in particular, and the individual ones communicated, and then you optimized toward the most prevalent single channel. Well, that's not the actual way people communicate at all. None of us communicate. How many of you communicate on things? Well, I love uh, email, so that's the only way I'm going to communicate, or it's the 98% of the way. No, you communicate the way you communicate at the moment you communicate. You, we're talking about devices that have 20 channels on them, 50 channels on them, depending on how many apps you've downloaded, 150 channels on them, right? I mean, that's the thing, right? You have, you have one device has multiple channels, and the real way we're looking at is omni-channel. And I am going to show you something right now that proves the case. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this is actually an interaction, a series of interactions with my niece four years ago. All right, she was 18, and my wife and I decided to buy her a laptop for going to college, and she asked for it, too. I mean, so one day I get on Twitter, I get a uh, tweet that says, uh, at P. Greenby, which is my Twitter handle, I need your cell number, hashtag love my uncle, hashtag miss you guys. She's one of those kids when Twitter was still 140 characters, 130 were hashtags. Now I think she's up to about 210 in hashtags, right? So you see like four, four letter actual messages. So I tweet back to her, I give her my cell number, I say I'll be around tomorrow, if you don't pick up, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you, I promise. Didn't hear from her for a few hours, but we were on kind of a time crunch, right? So. I go on Facebook and they say, hey, you want to talk during the week about the laptop? If it works, we can uh, go get it next weekend. She writes, that sounds good. And now I want you to listen to the next two entries real closely. I write, I'm on Facebook. Did you get my cell on Twitter? I DM'd you with the number. And she writes, I guess I got your number. I'll text you so you have mine. So now I want you to think about this. We just talked about Twitter, I'm on Facebook, text, and I mean, there's four channels here. That's the actual text conversation, and there it's basically a conversation of when we're talking on Skype. So we got on Skype, and we talked, and then we physically figured out what the laptop she wanted was, and we physically went to the store and bought it. Now this all happened in 36 hours, okay, and six channels. Now you go, okay, yeah, but she's 18, she's a digital native, you know, born and raised that way. I'm on Medicare, guys, and I know how to do this, right? So it's had nothing to do with being a digital native. It has everything to do with being somebody who gets the world we actually live in, and this is just simply the way we communicate, period. I, I guarantee if I take every single one of you, there may be one or two exceptions, though I doubt it you would even be here if you were actually an exception to this, who communicate pretty much that way is pretty much the way you do it. You don't think about what channel am I going to communicate on. You just communicate. Now, you want to go into the data of it? 
the, the best in class companies, but these are larger than most of you are, so you don't have to concern yourself this way, but just to give you the point, the best in class companies who perform with omni-channel strategies have optimized to seven channels minimum. Because there's six of them, right? So that, that's kind of the way this world works and how we communicate. So you're dealing with digital customers who might send you something that says, uh, hey, I need your address, can you text it to me? Now, if you're being smart, in that particular instance, you're not going to just respond to the email with an address. You're going to text it to them because they asked you to text it to them. Right? That's the key. That's an ordinary query with a channel that they need to communicate on and are asking you to do it for a reason. You don't know their reason, but they have a reason why they said that. Oh, I just say, I need your address. So you have to pay attention to that. That's what we mean by listening. Right? It's not just feedback. It's listen to what they're actually asking you. And the, the data goes into that everywhere. And we'll get to it when we look to managing and designing these things. But here's the other side, and this is the side that people miss constantly. You know, we all talk about like data and technology and systems and all day and night, but mostly it boils down to it. We happen to be dealing with people who have feelings, and that's how they work, and that's how we all work. We all have feelings, and everything we think is left brained and governed by math or governed by measurement isn't. It's governed by feeling. It's how I feel about it. I'll give you an example of what I mean. We'll take a, a hardcore ROI measurement. We're, I'm, a, I'm a company on the growth path, and I'm a CEO of the company, and I said, we're going to hit 50 million this year. And we do. On December 31st, we party, right? Because we hit 50 million, and it was awesome. And then as a CEO, though, I have a personal problem, and I resign. I have to go take care of that. New CEO comes in and looks at the data and says, eh, that's not so good. What's the difference? What, what number changed? Nothing. Just how you felt about it, right? And maybe it's how your stakeholders felt about it, your shareholders felt about it. Maybe it's just how somebody, your, your spouse felt about it. But one way or the other, it's how someone felt about it. We're always dealing with feelings. And the thing is that even though you see when you're looking at like text analysis, sentiment analysis, you know, five-point scale of positive, somewhat positive, neutral, somewhat neutral, I mean somewhat negative, negative, human beings' actually knowledge of their own feelings is far more granular than that. I'll give you an example. You see these things here? In love, love, like a lot, eh, don't like, hate. Now, I used to train on this stuff, right? A couple of years ago. Over the years, I gave probably to 10,000 10, people saw this, and I gave people five minutes to fill in something that met every one of those. And of all the people ever, no one ever failed to fill that in in five minutes. Now, I'll give you, and here's an example, here's mine. That's my wife, Yvonne, of 36 years. I told you already. Thank you. I like this audience a lot. No, actually, I love this audience. So I take it back. Right, I like a lot. Book I wrote, it's a book, okay? But, uh, eh, Starbucks, that's the best I can give it. Actually, it's probably a little more to a don't like now. Don't like, this is the Hudson Hotel, you'll understand why in a minute. Hate, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, but see, the interesting thing is, I can distinguish easily there, and I get, bet if I gave you the same survey, so could you. Easy. And that's how granular we are, but if you look at scales that people in larger companies use, stars. You look at review sites, it's stars. Here's an actual review site. This thing got two, uh, this thing got like four, four, it was actually four stars, I just put five up. But I want you to read how granular this thing, it's a simple little review. The service at this two-star Michelin restaurant was friendly, though not warm. So think about that. Now, you, you can't tell that from stars. You might get the same exact rating if it just said friendly. But friendly, though not warm, it's nuanced, and it's the way you operate will be very different than if all you knew was friendly. Friendly, you might not change anything. Not warm, you're going to change something, right, if you're managing to improve. But you can't do that by simple stars. You have to actually figure out how people are feeling about things, and you have to act. That's why you listen when they tell you. Now, the other thing to recognize when it comes to the customer is that, you know, guess what? We're, much as you love your own company, you're only a little part of their life, right? There's a whole lot of other things going on in their life, uh, all in all and always. So, 
for example, this is kind of the ecosystem of a company and a customer, and the larger company would look like that, but really, look at the customer's life. It's got friends, family, other companies dealing with everything else in the world going on with their life. Now, does that impact them? Yeah. In their dealings with you? Yeah. I'll give you an example. I uh, was once really pissed off at something. I don't remember what it was. And I went on Amazon to order a book. And uh, I'm on Amazon, and there's some sort of glitch in the lag time when I was hitting the button that it wouldn't work. So I just abandoned the cart and got off. So I was so irritated. Why? Because even though the lag was like six seconds, it was six hours in my head because I was so irritated by what had just happened to me. Now think about if I wasn't irritated. Six seconds, I would have waited. It would have gone through the end. Now, Amazon has no idea why I abandoned that cart at all. And I always get the question, well, how is Amazon going to find that out? But this goes to the other part of this. They're never going to find that out, right? But what they need to do is fix the lag time. Then they don't need to find it out, right? Because sometimes the way a customer reacts to you is due to a problem they may have had outside, but you actually have a problem too. And there you have to, again, when it comes to their experience with you, you have to distinguish. You always have to distinguish. And you have to take into account how they feel and how they're thinking and their behavior and what they're doing. And it's not a small or trivial task, but it's a very doable one. So what is customer experience really when it comes down to it? And there are actually three types of things. We're going to focus on the big one. This is Bruce Temkin's definition, not mine. You'll see mine in a minute. But it's close to mine. Customer experience is the perception the customers have of their interactions with an organization. Mine is very simple. How a customer feels about a company over time. Period. And it's feeling. Now, that said, don't accept the fact, when, if anyone ever pushes customer experience technology on you, don't accept that as a legit way of looking at it. It doesn't mean technology is not good, it's just a horrible messaging. There's no such thing as customer experience technology. You know why? You can't enable how someone feels. You can't do it. Right? There are ways of building and managing experiences, and we'll get to that, and they're called consumable experiences, which you can do. But not this. This is not enabled by feelings. This is your entire company, and you could be a company of one, 50, 100, 10,000, 400,000. Your entire company's reflection to that customer, how that customer feels about you is a sum total greater than the parts, really, of all the interactions they've had with you, all the engagement they have with you, and all the good and bad. And by the way, will change pretty much with the heaviest weight being on the prior interaction, right? The last one they had before they started thinking about you again. Now, fundamentally, it all boils down. When I first started in CRM, and that's 20 plus years ago, I said this, because this, as complex as all this gets sometimes, it's as simple as that. If a customer likes you and continues to like you, they'll continue to do business with you. If they don't, they won't. It's as simple as that. And you know that for your own experience as individuals. If you get pissed off at a company, unless that company's built up enormously good capital with you, you're done. You'll find someone else. Because you know why? It's easy to find someone else. Right? And that's the one thing that we all have to recognize now, especially, especially over the last 15 years, and where e-commerce has played an enormous role in changing, you know what else, by the way, e-commerce and delivery services, uh, FedExes and that like, a lot of level of playing fields here, right, as a result of that. So, the question then becomes, how do we begin to actually develop this? How do we start developing the kind of programs, strategies for small business, for large business? How do we develop them? Well, the first uh, concept you have to deal with always, and this is an imperative, to be honest, and I, look, I'm a New Yorker too, so basically I'm going to like, be very forceful on the way I do everything, so just be aware of that. Uh, so business value, customer value, two different ideas, completely different ideas. Businesses value what you expect, revenue, profitability. If you happen to have shareholders or stakeholders, then what their needs are, are part of what they value. Their success, uh, what you offer them is value. Customers don't value that. Customers don't really give a crap about that. Customers, what they value is feeling valued, right? If you show you feel that they are valued, they will continually respond. I'll give you an example. Imagine it's uh, January uh, 2018. We'll, back, we'll roll back a few months. And you get an email from a company you deal with, and it says, God, you're the most amazing customer ever. We love you. Um, we're going to give you 20% off on anything you want in the catalog. 
And you get the same email, January, February, March, April, May, and June. You don't get it July 1. Okay, hold that thought. January 2018, you get this email. Customer, you're a putz. We don't like you. Uh, the reason we don't like you is you keep talking to us. Stop talking to us. Uh, if you do, we'll give you 30% off on anything in the catalog. And you get this, January, February, March, April, May, and June. Instance number one, 20% off? You still a customer July 1? Of course. Instance two, you still a customer July 1? Unless you're deeply troubled? Probably not, right? Think about it. They've just spent six months telling you your crap, right, and giving you 30% off. And if you lasted six months at all, which another reason for therapy, uh, you know, if you lasted six months, you no way, if you don't have that offer, are you going to continue, right? But that's what I'm saying. It's not the discount. It's how they make you feel. It's the reason, in effect, for that discount. Right? That's what matters. And, and you have to put it that way. I'm going to show you a case study in a little bit, which really knows how to do it right. Right? So this is it. So now we start looking at, OK, what are, the, what are the emotional content that we have to offer when it boils down to it? To me, the number one, honestly, is not delight. OK? It's not delight. You do not have to delight the customer all the time. In fact, the whole definition of delight says it by itself. Do you know what the definition of delight is? The unexpectedly great thing happens, and then when it's done, it's not expected again. If you're trying to delight the customer all the time, it becomes expectation, right? If expectation is no longer delight, you up the ante, you up the ante, it gets more costly, it gets more costly. So many companies who, that's a mantra that companies might message with, and they're full of it. Right? You know what you have to do? You have to make it so that the ordinary gets taken care of. That's what you have to do, the utility. 90 to 95% of all service interactions, all our interactions with your customers, are nothing more than queries, questions to be answered, things to, that they're asking you to do for them that are simple. Right? They're not looking to be delighted, they just want the damn answer. Right? And the reality is you have to provide that answer to them. Right? And that's the ordinary, and if you, if you stick to the idea of keeping the ordinary ordinary, which we'll get to briefly, then you begin to get the idea of the foundation of showing the customer that they're valued. Yes, you do delight them occasionally, right? I'll give you an example of a, a sort of semi-creepy delight, right? This was done by KLM, the Dutch airline. They were watching a few holiday seasons ago. They were watching all the people who were checking in at the airports, and they were starting to monitor a bunch of them on social media to see what they were saying. And then it would find occasionally, like this specific example, uh, this is one guy who was, you know, he's sort of complaining, sort of, not complaining about them, but he was just sad he had to leave to go to New York and he would miss his favorite football team's game at that time. And, uh, and he really wanted to see it because he was so devoted a fan. So KLM greets him at the gate with a Lonely Planet guy to New York a bar circled in there where the football game is and a hundred dollar certificate for that bar. Now he, if you watch this video, you have to look for it now because it's, I forget how they title it, it's kind of obscure, but it's out there. He's like wildly excited about this, obviously. But do you think he was expecting it again? Of course not, that's delight, right? On the other hand, that can be interpreted as creepy too, but keep that in mind. And some of the people who got that did, right? So did it have mixed results? On the larger scope, no, it actually was positive. But, uh, but you're always going to have the people who see those kind of things as intrusions, and yet, you know, you'll learn by your mistake in that case. But the fundamental premise, if you're starting to at least treat the ordinary as ordinary, is that you have to be convenient for the customer. Convenience is the thing that drives most of us, really. How do we get it done in a frictionless way, as easy as possible, and, get it, and literally get it done? I mean, it's not just how do we get it done, it's get it done. And that means, you know, look, I want that email via text, please just send it to me via text, simple enough. And if you do that, I feel good about the fact you did that, thank you. I don't, it's not like I feel ecstatic, I just feel great, thank you, kind, fine, all's good. That's the most, here's a perfect example in my hometown. 
It's a UPS store. I know the manager there. And we're not that small a hometown. I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm dealing with some, you know, I'm in New York. I, I like cities generally, so I'm not the kind of person who lives in a town of 50. I just not built that way. But we have about, metropolitan area of our hometown is about 250,000 people, right? So it's not that small. But this is a local UPS store. And if you go into a typical UPS store, what do you got, right? You got shelving, which gives you all the supplies you need. You walk in there, you can bring your own box, right? You, they, and typically, the man, if the store personnel are good, you walk in, and uh, especially if it's a return or something, and you have the RMA, you just hand it to them, and, and they'll run a receipt immediately, and you leave. Within two seconds, you're pretty much done. You walk in, you walk out. And that's all you're looking for, and maybe a pleasant hello from the person. The end. And yet, that's, that, I literally go out of my way to go to that particular store, because I know the manager now, and I really like him. I have a new book coming out at, whenever, it's, the manuscript's done, let's just say that, we'll see the rest of the publication process. But, um, but in there, there's a whole section on, on that, right, how that works, right, because ultimately that's the, keeping the ordinary ordinary to the absolutely, to absolute perfection. All I want out of that is a utilitarian thing, and I don't care about anything else, really. I'm probably going somewhere else on my way there, you know, and there on my way to it. And they're, they're very mindful of that. If there's lines at the store, they'll actually find someone in the back and bring the employees forward, right, to help out. These are actually some of the fundamental emotional and uh, meaningful emotions that people will feel. The big one, if you want to know the truth, is validation, right? That you, that you feel validated. That's where you feel valued. And for me, like, I had, I'll give you an example. I, I fly a ton. I mean, like lots, like 200, 250,000 miles a year. And I, you know, because I fly so much, I've kind of focused on United, which I semi-regret. But at the same time, I'm global services on United. Well, remember I said I was a Medicare. I'm also trying to wind down this stuff, right? I, but at the same time, I really like global services. So last year, I kind of mentally developed a strategy to keep global, get global services back as invitation only and yet wind down my travel. So I sort of executed the strategy over the year, and then you have to wait till they invite you, right? And then I got the invitation, and I, I remember the day I got it, I went, yeah, like that, right? It's literally that accomplishment, right, in the upper left corner. It was like literally that feeling, and I got it. And it didn't make me love United, to be honest, any further, but it, I got at least, it was, that's the kind of thing you're evoking from people. Right? And you look, you could have, I don't know what your businesses are, and I don't know how big or small they are, but you could have five customers, it doesn't matter. And they could all be your relatives, it actually doesn't matter. Right? Literally, what matters is that you give them a sense of value, that you, which is where validation comes in, and you, you follow through on numbers of these things. All right, so how do we do this? So you remember what I said early enough, right? Which was, the ordinary needs to be kept ordinary. And the reason for that, I will show you, when the ordinary fails, the impact is greater on the experience than when the extraordinary and luxurious fail because there's no expectation of possible failure of the ordinary. If I'm asking for your address via text, I'm not thinking you're going to screw that up. If you screw it up, I'm more infuriated than you screwed up something exceptional I'm asking you because I'm asking you nothing that's even vaguely exceptional. So... The other side, if you'll note, all the way over on the left there, the customer's experiences should be good enough to create that company like me. What's a company like me? Remember what I was talking about, a person like me? Well, essentially, the customer needs to look at you and say, yeah, that's a company I feel has a relationship with me at some level. It doesn't have to be, it's not going to be, you know, personal, personal. It's going to be, it's going to be, I trust this company, I like this company, I, they're doing the kind of things that I appreciate. It's why uh, when you're in a, working in your company, let's say a business working, who is doing community work too, that matters a lot, right? Because you're doing something back for the community. And people, I'm not saying this, you should do that, period. But I'm saying that people, they note this. It's in their head. It's part of all that. You know, that, that's a company like me. is a person, a company that reflects the ideals. And that means the representatives of that company reflect the ideals that I have, reflect the needs I have, are similar to me. They have the same anxieties I have, whatever. But that, that's a feeling. It's not a really conscious activity. And, you know, we discussed it. Keep the ordinary ordinary. Meet and, and occasionally exceed 
the uh, customer's expectations and, and allow the customer to feel good about their involvement with you. So these are the kind of things they're looking for, the obvious things, too, on the basic thing. Products, services, tools, and consumable experiences. On that one, I'm going to hold off on the consumable experiences until we get to one of the case studies. When you're talking about it now, when we're down to the, the design, there's three things that have to happen. How does it make you feel? Does it do what the, you, what the people want it to do? And how, how effectively, how convenient is it? Then these are Bruce Temkin's three basic principles. And I'm going to show you something. Remember what I said, the fun you said functional? That's the one that pretty much is the foundational piece. It's still got to do primarily what they do. What you're seeing here is the Hudson Hotel in New York. All right, so several years ago, during the recession, actually, a decade ago, I was asked to speak at the uh, Japan Society, I think it was, and they put me up in this hotel. And this was like, you know, it was a recession. So this, there was a, a trend in hotels called <laughs> retro-European. And uh, what that meant was uh, dark lobbies, high ceilings, uh, um, you know, typical European hotels are a little smaller in room size, etc. So I come in to this hotel, and it's got this as the lobby, very dark lobby, attractive but dark, and they call the elevators lifts, right? I mean, this is in heart of New York, right? So. It was a Philippe Stark design building, completely modern, had one of the trendiest bars in the city, you know, white minimalist bar, right? Drinks were like $28 a drink. I, I actually had a friend of mine who was the CEO of this company I had literally never met, and he happened to be in New York, came over. I bought drinks, three drinks, cost me over 100 bucks, right? So, and this is in a 2008, right? So, uh, it's a trendy thing. So, I, I'm thinking, well, oh, this is sort of semi-cool. It's kind of a cool feeling and all that. Go to the room, unbelievable. What you're seeing here, uh, this is the actual thing, okay. I don't even know how to describe this, it's so bad, right? So if you lay on the bed, this is the best way to describe it. You lay on the bed, you turn right, you break your nose. You turn left, you break your nose, right? You want to drop a nickel somewhere, there's no room, right? You see that TV, where it is, like a hospital TV up on the pedestal? The reason is no room actually to put it on anything else. Off screen, there's a little table. And that's your work table, but there's no chair. You have to work at the edge of the bed. You see that curtain? And this is where it really gets gross. That translucent curtain is the wall to the bathroom. There is no wall. It's that curtain. Now, luckily, I was alone, so it didn't matter. But how disgusting is that, right? right? So, I mean, it didn't even meet the fundamental basic expectation of a hotel room, meaning I could sleep, do a little bit of work, and the end. That's all it needed to do. It didn't even do that cool bar, Philippe Stark designed building, you know, hottest trendy bar in the city, retro European high ceiling, pretty fixtures, worst room I've ever seen. I think about it, I've literally dissed this hotel to about probably 100,000 plus people in the last 10 years, right? So, right, so, I mean, that's how bad this hotel was. And it didn't even meet like the basic human function, right? Which is, and that's the ordinary failing here. That's the ordinary failing, because my, I have an expectation of a hotel, not of the Hudson Hotel, a hotel. And against that expectation, I'm measuring the Hudson Hotel. And it's a fundamental one. And I don't care how cool the damn place is. If I can't sleep in it, who cares? Right? So that's when we're talking about take care of the ordinary expectations, take care of the basics, take care of the utilitarian functions. Now, here's a company that does all that and more. It's called Waterfield Design Small Business www.sfbags.com. They they're designed for mostly business travelers, some a little bit for gamers, I think, because they have Nintendo Switch kind of stuff, too. It's basically bags. It's, it's uh, messenger bags. It's immerses, per, you know, it's, uh, this is all they do. And they're, they're modestly pricey. I mean, they're $350, let us say. Um, so the interesting thing about how their model works, though, is you go online, and you have modular choices, right? A large number of modular choices. It might sound ordinary, but it's not when you're dealing with bags. Usually they're mass produced, right? Here you can go online and you can add things to the bags and then they'll produce accordingly. You're still limited. This is what I call a consumable experience, right? In other words, you have choice. You pay extra for certain things, certain things come with it. You have choice of color, you have choice of additional things, you have choice of clasps, you have choice of, uh, depending on the bag, you have choice of like the cases in the bags, et cetera, et cetera. 
number of choices. And you pick and choose via pull-down menus, does your uh, little price table, and then you can pay. But it's where they go beyond that. Uh, you go to the site, they have all kinds of videos to help you with it, right, to take a look at what the bags look like inside and out. They spend a lot of time giving you resources to make a decision. That's another one. But then the customer service side comes. So I've, I've bought a few things from them over the years, and they, when they send an email just telling me that my bag has been shipped, they make a point of recognizing that I'm a past customer in the email, right? It's a simple thing. It's generated, obviously, but it doesn't matter. That little tiny bit of personalization makes a gigantic difference. It's the pre and, it's, and the email saying it's been sent out, signed by the president of the company, right? But do you see how this works? Again, he's, it's one time he did it once, I'm sure, and then they mass generate them against the data they have in their... Uh, in their database. But the reality is that's little things that add up to really feeling good about the way you interact with these people. And they are, as a result, wildly successful. Look them up. You'll find out article after article on these guys. I know the uh, president now a little bit personally because I interviewed him for the book because I really liked what he was doing. I'm saying these are the, what, when you're starting to design the experience, you're designing it mostly for the little things. The big things are less important. It's the little things that let them, peep, the things that let people feel that you value them in some way and that they're special and a little different. They don't have to be, and again, they can be mass generated things as long as there's an understanding that they know something more about you than some just generic thing. When you're dealing with a sports team, the core to a sports team is the season's ticket holder. It's not ticket holders, it's not merchandise, it's the season's ticket holder. That's repeatable revenue, that's, it's known and repeatable, and they can actually, they can, and, they will, and, and it tends to be renewed pretty consistently. But the, there's a great deal of benefit. Look, I mean, sports is different, right? It has advocates, you, we're all trying to build advocates. They're just trying to manage advocates, right? The fans are fans. I mean, you don't, they're not try, they don't have to create them. They're there. Look, I mean, I've made clear my allegiance, right? So I'm a fan. But what they're trying to figure out on the one hand is, okay, on the one hand, how do we engage all our fans, but also how do we get our season's ticket holders more directly uh, in, engaged better so that we can get them to renew early? Because you renew early, there's cash in the bank, there's, you don't have to worry about them. There's a lot of other things you can do. And it's a really important nuance. It's time for them, not so much the renewability overall. So they had two programs they designed. One is called How You Doing, which was based on friends. It didn't start in that, the program didn't start in the 90s, though. The program started in the 20 teens. And then Early Birds, which was the season's ticket holder renewals. How You Doing was very simple. This is the culture of the organization, right? And this is from, uh, at the time, uh, well, currently, the Sean Tilger is the, basically the COO of the Flyers. How you doing programs, the culture of this organization, we're always making sure we aren't just implementing software, we're inventing the philosophy and outlook into everything we do internally and externally. What did that mean? Okay, imagine this. You walk into the Flyer Stadium, you're greeted. As soon as you're greeted, somebody's going to say, can I do anything for you? If you say yes, they will leave their station and go do whatever it is you need them to do and then someone will fill in their station. But two things that they want to make sure happen are someone's, everyone is greeted who walks into, uh, into Wells Fargo, and, and if there's something that has to be done, it gets done. And it's as simple as those two things. Now, once, as they go off and do these things, and either they come back to you and say it's done, or you go with them, you've been handed a card when you walked into the stadium too, and the card said, how'd we do? And you went to five stars, and you can name a person, and there's hundreds of locations around the stadium to just drop the cards in the, you know, like a, a hopper. And they say, if you want to, please fill this out. All right, so what happens? Well, the staff, if you're a staffer, you get rewarded. But you know what you get rewarded with? You get rewarded with things like vacations, not $10, right? You get rewarded with, could be $500. Look what happened. 87% of all fans agreed it, five out of five, 97%. You know, keep in mind how many thousands of people we're talking about here. What, how complicated was what I just said? One, make sure that you recognize the customer. Two, make sure that you take care of the customer. That's all they're doing. 
and they're making sure their employees are benefit from that too because we're all self-interested. Now, when you came in in certain areas, you would get this. Uh, you get this, early bird renewal card. Early bird is very simple. It's season ticket holder renewal early. They did an analysis of all their ticket holders for propensity to renew early. And for the two and three star out of five that renew early, they would take you in from a game and they bring you in and give you ice cream and they give you beer and wine and talk to you about early renewal. And it was in the Hall of Fame room, so you see the whole history of the team, which of course was designed to have an emotional impact because that's why you're a season ticket holder. For four and five star, they got a postcard. But I want you to see one thing that reflects the whole postcard here. It basically at one point says that if you renew early, you will have the right for your kid to get on, if he's 6 to 14, to get on the ice and high-five the team when they come out. I'd do that, okay? I would do that. I mean, I'm telling you, that is just amazing. But that's what you get. In other words, these are all experiences that are designed to get them to renew early. So what are the numbers? One stars renewed 83.7% early. Two stars, 87.5, three, 84.3, 89.14, 92%. This is of all season ticket holders, that's how early. Year over year, they got 1,000 more every year. If you take all the lessons combined that I just outlined, the one thing that I think, I hope comes through is take care of the customer. When you're talking about how the, understand that the customer's value, the uh, way they value things is to feel valued. Take care of that, right? Number one. Number two, that means do the things they ask you to do, understand them. When you can't do them, tell them, right? And, and, as simple as this, right? Make sure that when you're interacting with them, you're aware, of, and this is a fact you might not think about right now, but you're aware of the fact that you're not, all their, you're not their entire life, right? And consequently, other things would be impacting. With that, thank you very much.